So what dynamic development means is that you, you're starting when you learn something, it, you create it, and then it falls apart. And you recreate it, and it falls apart. And it continues like that. That's what this top line is showing you. So you come and you listen to this talk about neuroscience and Montessori, and oh, wow, this is great. It's about connections and pruning, myelinization, right? After this talk, you go, you talk with somebody else. They say, what did you just listen to? You say, um, uh, this thing about the brain, right? It was good. But then you're with somebody, you watch a little piece again, you read an article, something reminds you, your knowledge increases. It falls apart again, you revisit, it goes up. You get little scaffolds that pull you up higher, something that makes it higher and easier for you to remember it until you master it at this level. But if you're tested, you might show this real linear development like that of actually what you're able to do without scaffolds and without support. Okay, and that's why a lot of times Montessori teachers will say, I know he can do it, I see him doing it in the classroom all the time. But that's because there are scaffolds in the Montessori environment. Testing is a functional level without any supports, or it often is today in, in the American culture anyhow. But in the Montessori environment, you can see that there are many scaffolds. The materials are scaffolds. The parents and the educators are scaffolds. This educator is reminding the students of something, exciting her about something so that she can go on and, and take the next step. This parent is helping a scaffold so that the child can do it himself, but not alone because he can't do it entirely on its own. The adult helps give him something that will help him. He, just take the grapefruit. Put the grapefruit on the shelf. Maybe hand him one thing at a time. All humans are actually scaffolds, whether we realize it or not, because we have this thing in us which is called mirror neurons. Now, I love this picture. These, this is not a mirror. These are two different kids dressed similarly. Look, look at how happy he is. Look at that happy kid. Because kids are driven to mimic each other. We see this all the time. They're copying each other. They're copying us all the time, right? This is normal. Well, there's a part of our biology does this, and I'll tell you the story of how this does, was discovered. So there's a scientist who was working with this little monkey and had a little EEG cap on the monkey, and he's not getting any good data. The scientist is getting frustrated. Nothing's happening. And so he stops, he takes a break, and he starts eating some peanuts. Well, the monkey wants these peanuts, right? And so what does this great scientist do, right? So don't be impressed with scientists because here's what he does. He sticks out his tongue at the monkey, all right? He sticks his tongue out, all right? So what does the monkey do? The monkey sticks his tongue back out at the scientist. So here you got the scientist, and then you got the monkey, okay? So what happened is they had this little EG cap on the monkey while this was happening. So they saw that when the monkey saw the tongue being stuck out, or when the monkey stuck his own tongue out, the same areas of the brain became active. So whether he perceived that someone else was doing it or whether he did it himself, the brain was active in a very similar way. So we are literally biologically participating in each other when we perceive something's happening to each other. So this, of course, has huge implications when you think about violence on television or in media. Right? If you're witnessing any violent event, either live or, or recorded, your brain is participating in it as if it were experiencing that violent event. If you are witnessing an heroic event, your brain is participating as if it were in this heroic event. And sometimes you'll get the courage to step up and help in some way because of that witnessing. Those are your mirror neurons activating. And this is why role models are so important in Montessori education. Role models from peers and from the adults. And Montessori knew this. The child reproduces in himself as if by a form of psychic mimesis the characteristics of the people in his environment. And here she is with her, her wonderful son mirroring her joy and peace. Right? So the other thing that's going on in, as a scaffold is processing time. And processing time is something that we do in Montessori environments intentionally with uninterrupted work periods, long time for concentrating on work periods. And what's going on in there is we're actually allowing the brain to um, strengthen its default mode connections as well as develop its attentional networks. But let me tell you a little bit about the default mode. So this is another little discovery. With, the, with um, They were using mice in a maze, and they had little caps on the mice, and the mice are walking around the maze. The mouse gets to point one in the maze, and point one in the brain gets active. Gets to point two, and point two gets active. 
gets to 0.3 and 0.3 gets active. The mouse gets to 0.4, he stops, he scratches, he sniffs, and in the brain, points 4, 3, 2, and 1 get active. So it's in the pause that the information gets reflected upon, consolidated. That's why timing to learn is so important. The ability to pause and process is really essential, really essential. So we must allow children processing time if we want them to grow long, strong connections. And in fact, long-range connectivity is in correlates with impulsivity. At least this study with by Tomasi, which is a fantastic study, you should check it out. Um, the hypothesis based on the results of this study is that the default mode network connections lengthen during typical development, right? And that makes sense. We know that local connections give range to long range connections with experience and age. And that in people who are impulsive, the, the development of the default mode network is delayed. And this data is showing you on the top the short range, there are more short range connections in impulsive juvenile delinquents, those with ADHD versus typically developing children and adolescents, um, versus in the long range connections, there are few, fewer long range connections in the subjects with ADHD versus typically developing um, adolescents. So one thing to think of when you think about fast paced or you think about um, connectivity rather is fast paced television and this great study by Angeline Lillard looked at that in five-year-old children and found that just nine minutes of watching fast-paced um, television disrupted their ability to perform on executive function tests. Now think about uh, executive functions for a minute. Those mean cognitive flexibility, the ability to think not necessarily literally. So if I say to a three-year-old, "Throw, can you throw this in the trash? they might throw it across the room, right? You say that to a seven-year-old, they don't throw it across the room. They understand that it's an idiom that they mean walk across and place it in the trash. That's cognitive flexibility. Don't take it too literally. Inhibition, the ability to prevent yourself from doing something that maybe isn't so skillful like yelling at your boss, right? Stopping yourself as a child from pushing another child. Self-control. Working memory, the ability to keep track of things actively so that you can assign meaning to what matters and what doesn't. Reasoning and problem solving. So when you think about uninterrupted time, long range connections and that fast paced television, this is what you're thinking about. Come over here to this age seven, we've got this tangle of connections and the child's watching Spongebob or some other fast paced show. What happens is they're watching, they start to process, boom, something changes. But watch, boom, something changes. Watch, boom, something changes again. They never get a chance to do all the way in the long connections. They're always interrupted, short, 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 okay? That's one way to think about how that can um, be related. So executive functions develop over time, but they develop really strongly in the youngest years. Ages three to six is when you see this huge growth in executive function capacity. Right? Typically, we're talking about the prefrontal cortex um, when we talk about executive functions. But there's also working memory happening in other parts of the brain, particularly par parietal areas, um, which I am really interested in. They say that neurons that fire together wire together. You may have heard that before. So if we're doing, my hypothesis is that if you can educate the senses in certain ways, particularly with depth, stereognostic use, um, then you may be able to improve working memory and overcome some deficits that, deficits that are up here in the prefrontal area by accessing the working memory that's happening in the parietal lobe. Another thing we know about executive functions is that vocabulary and language skills help children regulate their behavior. Up here on the top are children in the dark lines are children who have 75th percentile of vocabulary. That means they have strong vocabulary capacities. These lighter lines are children with lower vocabulary capacities. And this up here is showing you the self-regulation score. This is between the ages of 12 months and 36 months. And you can see a significant difference between children with lo better vocabulary abilities and their ability to self-regulate. They're regulating at a much higher level than children with lower vocabulary abilities, particularly boys with lower vocabulary abilities. 
We also know when thinking about vocabulary and language that reading networks vary in different languages. So when you talk about those connectivity languages, they're going to be different based on what language you're speaking. It, can, it makes sense if you think about it, but here we have for Italian the areas that are used um, versus in English some areas that are used. Of course, Italian is a phonetic language and English is only partially phonetic. So some areas are the same, some areas are different. So when you think about that, it makes sense that you might have a benefit if you're bilingual in your executive function um, capacities because you're going to have more network connectivity happening between those different areas of the brain. And this um, study showed that in these light gray um, bars are children who are in a monolingual environment and the height is their um, executive function scores in these two different tasks. The dark, the black bars are children who are bilingual from birth. Okay, they're in a home where one parent speaks one language and another parent speaks another language. Now, they have superior executive function to children in a monolingual environment. Now, this last bar, don't be too concerned about it. The authors of this study realized that this is for children who were in a kindergarten immersion program, and it was after only six months of immersion. They expected that this data would change with longer study. Okay, so don't be too worried about that. Immersion programs, I think, are likely to show um, a benefit in executive function, just as um, native bilingual environments will. So the other thing is that when we're under stress, we actually lose this prefrontal area. We lose the ability to use it, okay? So executive functions is our ability to remember, make good decisions, cognitive flexibility, reason, logic, working memory. And if we're under acute stress, we lose that ability. Our activity comes down to the limbic area and to our survival areas, our brain stem. Okay? This is really important when you think about what's going on with children and when we correct children. Not only do we have that part about error correction and error detection being in the same neural substrate, we have this part about acute stress. And if we correct them, or if we get corrected, our ability to really use our cognitive functions can shut down. So think about what happens if your boss, you know, says to you, what did you do? Right? What happens? You kind of jump. And then that's like the feeling of you losing your prefrontal um, ability and the activity coming down to your limbic system. And then the boss, your boss says to you, what are you going to do about it? And you go, well, uh, I, uh, and you kind of say something, right? Maybe it makes sense, maybe not so much, something comes out. But you're not really thinking straight at that moment with all of your cognitive capacities, okay? So it's important for us to remember to really ask only what the child can give. If the child is under stress, they're not really going to be able to perform at their optimal level. They may not even be able to perform at their typical functional level, okay, when you're under acute stress. Same for you as an adult working with children. The good news is that inspiration can help us get around any little gaps or deficits that we have because inspiration accesses more brain real estate. And there's great work by Mary Helen Imordino Yang. You should Google her, go to her website, read everything she's ever written. And her work focuses on how when you're inspired, you actually use more parts of the brain. And so you can get around possibly some gaps that Every one of us has. Nobody has a perfect brain that's perfectly connected in every way. We all have strengths. We all have challenges based on our genetics and on our environmental experiences. Inspiration can help us overcome all of that. And so I want to give you a little inspiration about how our brains are so different and they are the same at the same time. It's the genet our genetics and our experience that make our brains unique.